across the chamber. And uh, thank you, George, for such a uh, wonderful um, introduction. Uh, so, um, I'm Gordon Wise. I work for the, uh, uh, sorry, let's say, volunteer for the National Trust at uh, the White Cliffs. Um, became involved with the Trust in 2013, and uh, that was when the Fan Bay project was just starting. And I've been involved with it ever since. <coughs> Um, I'll speak about my auto ego later, um, so please bear with me on that one for the moment. But my talk to you tonight is about the 540th Coast Regiment, um, but not so much about the guns, the concrete and the endless facts about ranges, etc. It's more about the people and some of the stories that we've unearthed um, during our research. After all, what good is a gun site if you don't have the gunners to actually aim and fire the guns? But, of course, most of what I'm going to tell to you about tonight is actually secret. And um, so, therefore, um, if you would kindly forget everything I tell you tonight, <laughs> otherwise the regimental CO will be after me in the morning and you all know what life can be like. Um, however, um, I included this little slide because um, it's a wonderful play on words, especially this lot of months. It makes him simply furious. And also the third line, ships, guns and shells, which is what we're going to talk about really. Um, so, um, just in case you don't know anything at all about the actual regimental area, the 540th Coast Regiment Royal Artillery consisted of three gun sites. Fan Bay, uh, three six-inch guns, the 203rd Coast Battery, the South Orland, the 49.2s, manned by the 290th Coast Battery, and Wonston Farm, the two 15-inch guns named Jane and Clem, the largest guns ever mounted on UK soil, 302nd Coast Battery. The regimental area, um, it runs roughly two miles from uh, St. Margaret's, the South Orland Valley there, um, through to Wolves Dover, and that is Fan Bay there, and that is the Wonston Farm site there, Jane and Clem. Uh, this is Reach Road here, uh, just to get your bearings. Um, the primary role of the guns is not as was widely popularised to shell France or bomb the enemy uh, positions, it was uh, to stop enemy shipping. And the three gun sites worked together. Uh, Fan Bay's range is this blue line, the South Orland is the green line, and the Wonston. So Wonston is the only set of guns that can actually reach the French coast. The reason why the story was allowed to perpetuate, it was if you like fake news that was put around. Um, in actual fact, we have actually found out that uh, the Royal Artillery, especially in this area, were actually hated by the locals because um, their argument was, well, what can the gunners see at night? What can the gunners see in bad weather? They're just firing at front, uh, the Germans to antagonise them. And of course, the Germans used to respond by shelling the uh, towns. It was a bigger target, easier to hit. But of course, what they actually had was radar. Um, now, radar was actually top secret, and um, if you remember what I was saying about careless talk, um, in the same way that, uh, that we knew that Germans had radar, they knew we had radar, but the story of gun duels across the channel was allowed to perpetuate for the benefit of um, keeping radar a secret. <laughs> However, I think what we're going to talk about is some of the people. And this is the first lady that we're going to talk about. Uh, Ethel May Pridmore, born 1920 in Dover. Uh, Ethel was an ATS lady, and uh, she, as you can see there, two elder brothers and an elder sister. She would eventually marry a Jack Owen, um, who she met while she was working in the Coastal Artillery Room. This is the Coastal Artillery Room here. It's actually in dumpy level of the castle. Um, which is an area which you can't normally get to. Um, the recreation they've done is very good, but it's not in, actually in the right place. Uh, in the picture, this gentleman here is Brigadier Raw. He's the commander of Coastal Artillery. This gentleman here is Lieutenant Grace. Um, and we'll see a picture of Lieutenant, or rather a caricature of Lieutenant Grace later. Uh, the picture which you see uh, with May here, 
or Ethel, um, is taken September 1943. It's at the Fan Base Sports Day, and it's the dog that provides us with our first link. Um, the, last year, the National Trust were lucky enough to be able to purchase 25 glass negatives. The quality of these negatives is absolutely astounding. And one of our volunteers spent many hours extracting the electronic um, prints off of the uh, glass negatives. And as you can see, the quality of them is absolutely amazing. Now this picture is actually of number four gun at South Foreland. And whilst in, in itself it is very interesting, it's actually this little bit here that we're more interested with. And I've blown it up so you can uh, see. Now, in actual fact, there's two soldiers there, and now, is it a cat, is it a dog, or as some person once said to me, it's a chicken. <laughs> um, you can make your own mind up, but I'm going to stick with the dog, because we do know that a stray black Labrador found his way onto the gun site and was befriended by the gunners, and hence he got his name of Gunner. He became the unofficial mascot of the regiment. And is that the same dog that Ethel is holding? I believe it to be so. Um, now, a stray dog is not unusual, but the date of the photograph is 1941. And at this point, stray dogs are actually being actively round up, rounded up and disposed of. Um, this is because there is a ban on feeding those animals. Um, now, one thing that is certain is that Gunner is leading a bit of a charmed life because he has at least 500 Gunners to protect him and also no doubt the odd tip bit or two from the cookhouse. But one thing that is not really known about the, uh, about the, um, the, the uh, culling of, is the culling of pets. Now this culling took place in 1939 and it occurred um, due to a phrase in a home office pamphlet that was published and that, that pamphlet was then rebroadcast on the BBC. This saw uh, large numbers of pet owners gathering up their loved um, dogs and cats, racing them off down to various vets and animal charities and having them put down. In all, 750,000 animals lost their lives in the first week of the war and not one single one of them was due to enemy action. Um, the only reason the culling stopped was because the vets, etc. ran out of barbiturates. Now, one of the things that we did unearth was, during the research of this, is that during the war there were numerous uh, reports of uh, animals and stories of dogs and cats actually assisting their owners um, during uh, bombing, etc. Ethel provided us with another link. Now, some years ago, uh, local papers um, asked for people to come forward, people that had been involved in the war, people that had been youngsters or had served during the war, come forward, tell their stories and show any artefacts. picture of Ethel appeared in the Dover Express in her ATS uniform, but this particular uh, caricature set was in, her, um, was in her possession and this was republished. Uh, this gentleman down here, this is Captain Owen. He's portrayed as a baby in a playpen because he was the youngest officer in the coastal artillery room. Hence the reason why he gets uh, the youngest thing there. Um, you have uh, Brigadier Raw here. You remember I was saying Lieutenant Grace earlier on? There he is, there's the caricature of him. And we're going to see a little bit more of this gentleman later on, Major Huddlestone. Uh, but one thing I'd like you to do is note how all of the people are shown. Very big heads and small bodies. Uh, two years ago, a lady contacted the National Trust and she wanted to uh, make sure that this particular um, piece of paper that was in her position went to a safe home, uh, which we had provided for her. And once again, we noticed that there was a similarity between Ethel's uh, picture that had appeared in the paper and this one, you know, the big big heads and the small bodies. And But other than that, we didn't know any other details, why they were connected or indeed who the artist was. Last year, a lady called Lydia Price contacted us and she said that she had uh, in her possession an autograph book which had a number of signatures in it from the soldiers and also some original artwork that was drawn by one of the uh, soldiers. When she described the artwork, it was obvious that she was talking about the same artist. 
big heads and small bodies. And what we actually have um, is a chap called William or Bill Hudson. And this we believe to be Mr. Hudson here. If you notice, a very distinctive signature. The H, U and the T form in the house. And then if you could see the chimney, it's actually behind him. Uh, you would see the letters S, O and N form the smoke coming out of the chimney. But if you look carefully there, there's a gentleman and he's, painted, he's actually doing a caricature of a person with a big head and a small body and he's saying it's taking shape a bit. So we believe that to be um, Bill Hudson. The, uh, these are the two pieces of original artwork that uh, Lydia has actually given to us. Uh, the White Cliffs Rebels, they were a concert troop formed by the 540th Coast Regiment. They gave um, uh, concerts all over the area. Uh, we've got reports of them, Faversham, Dover, Deal and Folkestone. And um, again, all drawn by Mr. Hudson, there's his distinctive signature. Um, after the war, Bill Hudson will go back to his trade of a commercial artist and he actually used to produce a large number of the uh, theatre flyers for London Palladium and other big London theatres. Unfortunately, Tracy and Mr. Hudson is a bit of a dry desert and um, we haven't actually been able to find out very much else about him at all. The gentleman there, Uncle Reg, Uncle Reg is actually this gentleman here, uh, Reginald Mepstead. He's Lydia's uncle and um, the family were all involved, they all lived in the Ramsgate area. Uh, Lydia's father uh, was a train driver during the war and apparently he had a number of uh, narrow escapes when his train proved an irresistible target for marauding German fighters. Um, Reggie's father, um, the gentleman there, uh, his father is listed in the 1911 census as a grave digger in the St. Lawrence Church in Ramsgate. Um, so, that brings us to the end of those, and our next set of links are provided by the daughter of this gentleman, Gunnar Thomas Montague Owen, known as Tom in the Army and Monty to everybody else. Uh, Monty, born 1912 in Southampton, however, grew up and was educated in East Ham in London. The move was to do with his um, his father, who is listed as a moat supervisor. If anybody has any idea what a moat supervisor is, please see me after the break because I'd love to know. Um, I've never found out what it is. However, by 1939, um, he's back in uh, Southampton. He's working in the Lloyds branch at uh, uh, Lindhurst, and then he moves to the Eastley branch, and it is the Eastley branch that will prove very beneficial to him later. Uh, picture here, this is, um, uh, this is uh, Tom here in the fire control at uh, South Foreland. The building still exists, it's called Baby Dolphins. Um, it's just outside the gate of the South Foreland Lighthouse. And uh, this picture is actually now the gentleman's living room. He has altered it slightly, I understand, but um, uh, it, it is actually his living room. So, um, Obviously, come the end of the war, um, Thomas stayed on in the army for a little bit. Um, he must have done because his um, stamp for his final unit is the 4th Coast Training Regiment. They came into effect in 1945 when the 540th was disbanded at the end of the war. But this is a copy of his release certificate, his military conduct there exemplary. And as you can see, a steady, reliable and trustworthy man with lots of brain and initiative. Lovely, lovely turn of phrase. Uh, after being released from the army, Tom goes back to his uh, work in the Lloyds Bank in the Eastley branch, and there he meets Pamela Woodgate. Uh, Pamela had been an evacuee from London down to Southampton, and when she uh, became of age for working, she actually went to work in the Lloyds branch, uh, same Lloyds branch as Tom was and they fell in love and they got married. And I think that's an absolutely superb um, picture there. I think the, the look of adoration on her face is absolutely amazing. Um, they married in 1950, and Tom remained working within the same branch until he returned, retired in 1972, but he didn't actually retire because he went back the following day as a security guard. 
Um, Tom died, as you see there, 1999, and Pamela in 2013, and I have to say I am completely indebted to Ruth, his daughter, for providing us with all the pictures and the, um, uh, information. She also gave us these as well, which were also part of her father's collection, and they are actually very important, these pictures. They're all taken on the 10th of July, 1943, during a visit by Henry Stimson. Henry Stimson is the United States Secretary of State for War. That is that gentleman there, very influential and a great friend of Britain. He was a great proponent of Lee's Lend. Um, other people in the picture, Brigadier Raw, uh, this gentleman here in the battle dress is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Richards, the regimental CO. This gentleman is John Winnant, who is the um, American ambassador to London, and obviously the great man himself, uh, his wife, and the other lady is Winnant's wife. Uh, so it's actually a very important uh, visit, and uh, the pictures there, this is Stimson, that's Richards, and of course, uh, the gentleman needs absolutely no introduction. And again, it's the pictures from Ruth that provide us with our next link. And welcome to my alter ego, Captain Arthur Lionel Strange at your service, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, um, Captain Strange, known as Lionel, and uh, born in Wolverhampton, and um, We've only just literally found out last week that he died in 2015. Um, he moved out to Manatic in uh, Ontario. Uh, he died uh, in Manatic. Father, uh, Ernest William Strange, he was actually an anaesthetist at Wolverhampton Hospital. And his grandfather, also called Arthur, listed in the 1891 census as a physician and superintendent at the Pauper Lunatic Asylum in Ashton under Lyme. Um, so obviously he comes from a medical family. Uh, what Arthur did after the war, we're not quite sure, but um, uh, he clearly comes from a medical background. Um, you see there, he was married to Evelyn Temple. Evelyn was also a nurse who trained at the London Hospital. So there's the full picture, uh, which was colourised by a friend of mine, uh, Captain Strange. I said that we would see a bit more of Major Huddleston later, that is Major Huddleston there. Uh, the gentleman, the officer in the background, unfortunately we don't know who he is. We know he's a staff officer and that's all we do know about him. Um, so, the picture was actually taken uh, outside of the crew shelter at number one gun, Wonston Farm, called Jane. And the clue is just in the background of the two officers there, you can make out a little bit of a bar there and a bucket. It's actually the fire bucket and it's stand. And the, two, and the two items are still extant even to this day. The bucket, I'm afraid, does not hold water. Um, there's a famous song said there's a hole in my bucket, but um, that's a bit more than a hole, actually. Um, but they are still both there. Uh, going on to Arthur himself, he was uh, posted to the 540th in June of 1942 as a captain and he became uh, the deputy fire commander, quite a senior position within the regiment. And um, he was appointed to command the Fan Bay Battery, which is one of the reasons why we are using him as an alter ego um, at the Fan Bay Tunnels. Um, he was appointed that position in August of 1944. Uh, he became major strange at that point, and he remained in command until January 45, when he proceeded on uh, embarkation leave before going out to India uh, as a posting and he had married Evelyn in 1944. Um, at some point we believe now about 1960 um, the whole family moved out to Manatic in Ontario. So to our next link. <laughs> No, we are not talking about the late, great Frankie Howard. We're talking about this gentleman here, Senator Ludicrous Sextus. Um, or as you may know him, the actor Wallace Eaton. Or to give him his real name, Walter Reginald Eaton. And I'm going to use his given name tonight. Uh, Walter uh, was born in uh, 1917 in Leicester. And he joined the army in 1940, was commissioned in 1941. Uh, digging back a little bit on his past, um, we find that um, his, uh, 
uh, some of his uh, aunts and uncles were involved in the shoe trade in Leicester, which I don't know whether you're aware, but uh, Leicester had one of the largest concentration of shoe uh, factories and shoe employment uh, in the country. Uh, Walter's father, John, he also went into the shoe trade, uh, this did in 1911 as a pressman. Um, his mother, Clara Jarum, uh, born in um, 1898, um, she died very young, aged only 23. Um, as an actor, Morris had a huge um, and very long career. He appeared radio, television, film and stage. Um, 1939 registered to show him as an actor, uh, but he'd actually already made his first debut, 1936 at the Theatre Royal in Leicester. 1939 saw him making his London debut at the Old Vic. Um, his acting career resumed after the war. In actual fact, it resumed rather interestingly because he actually took over from Captain Strange or Major Strange as the officer commanding Fan Bay. And it appears that he may have been given special leave to continue his acting career because whilst the war diary shows him in command of the battery, he's actually in the London on stage. Um, with, I believe, at that point, uh, the skin of our teeth playing alongside Vivian Lee. So, quite interesting, that one. Uh, Walter would go on to play in over 25 films, 50 TV productions. If anybody remembers Jimmy Edwards on the radio, Jimmy Edwards show, Walter um, was the voice of Jimmy Edwards' conscience. Um, he died in 1995, aged 78, um, and he went out, um, he died in Australia, he'd gone out there to pursue his love of sailing, and um, uh, that's where he died. But he also did act um, in a couple of um, shows, namely The Young Doctors and the Country Practice in Australia. Um, one of the other links, and I'm indebted really to this one, to John Vaughan from the Sussex History Forum, because it's very nice. Um, it's a picture of the 540th Coast Regiment officers. Um, there is uh, uh, Major Eaton, Walter Eaton. Uh, here is Captain Strange, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Richards. One thing about Lieutenant Colonel Richards is that I have never yet seen a photograph where he even remotely smiles. Um, next to him, Major Edmonds, Major Mallinson, and Captain Borman. It's actually taken in the garden of the South Gordon Lighthouse but it's not the upper lighthouse, it's the lower lighthouse, and it, that's identifiable by that wall, which, still expect, which is still there today. So, to our next link. Yes, no, we're not talking about Windsor Davis, although Windsor did actually say in an interview that he based um, Regimental Sergeant Major Shut Up Williams on four different RSMs that he came into contact with during his military service. Um, but, um, contrary to popular belief, even battery sergeant majors have to start somewhere, and we're going to talk about this man here, George Duggan, Gunner George Richard Duggan, and I'm indebted to um, his son John, who's in the audience today for the, uh, for the information. Uh, John was actually in the heavy anti-aircraft um, brigade. Now, there is a link to the 540th. Immediately behind Jane is an anti-aircraft position known as D2. Um, in actual fact, at the outbreak of war, George is actually with uh, D3, which is at Frith Road, uh, near, just north of Dover. Um, but he does actually spend a couple of days billeted at D2. Um, now, he carried on uh, all throughout the war in the, uh, in the uh, heavy anti-aircraft uh, regiment, um, and he was uh, promoted to uh, local sergeant in September 39. The reason for that was that he had actually been uh, in the army prior to the war, um, so he had the experience, he had the knowledge. And the whole regiment eventually moved out of Dover in uh, late 1940, having been in the thick of the Battle of Britain the whole time, and went up north uh, to Sheffield. And at that point, his army service career starts to read like a cook's tour of the, Mid of the Midlands and southeast England. However, by 1942, even the writers have got fed up writing, uh, writing in all the different town names and places where he had been, and all they just put is UK, far easier. Um, 
1943, George is actually given a reprimand uh, for the loss of a rifle, a very serious crime, but it didn't end his career, and um, shortly after that, um, in 1945, he was promoted to Battery Sergeant Major while serving with 422 Battery. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that one of the places where we got confirmation of his promotion was actually in the Dover Express. Uh, just before we look at that, this is his good service certificate and his efficiency medal, um, which you got if you had been a good boy with undetected crime. Uh, so, here we are, Dover Express, 1945, uh, full name, uh, complete with the fact of his address and the fact that he was married, and he's just been promoted to Battery Sergeant Major. So much for secrecy. I mean, that is just absolutely amazing, but never mind. Um, and also then we have um, his uh, release um, papers. Again, exemplary conduct, and you can see, again, and strangely enough, we notice the same type of wording, a, a reliable and trustworthy man carried out the duties of a warrant officer. So, uh, very good. And um, George comes out, and uh, that's the end of his war career. So thank you very much indeed, John, for the information. That's much appreciated. Uh, but before we leave, George, just a couple of really old photographs. Now, this one's actually really interesting because this is George here, stood next to his uh, gun. And if you notice, there are field guns. Uh, behind there, just written on the uh, side of the door, the 233 battery, Royal Artillery. <coughs> and... Originally, that's what they were. They were a fuel, raw field artillery. They were remobilized at the outbreak of war, as were a lot of field regiments uh, mobilized into the anti aircraft. And this picture here is George grinning there nicely. Um, who uh, this is after their conversion, we believe it's taken up in Ipswich, and um, it's after their conversion to um, heavy anti aircraft gunners. Now, um, I'm going to leave George now. A couple of other pictures now. Um, this is all courtesy of Edward John Hammond, or the family of. Now, Edward Hammond was the regimental sergeant major, so he's one up from um, George. This we believe to be the 302nd Coast Battery at Wanston Farm. The only reason we say that is because that is definitely the Wanston Farm house. Uh, in the background there, and that is about the right number of gunners that you would have had in a single battery. So we believe that to be the, um, uh, the 302nd. This picture here is actually really quite interesting. Again, uh, this is um, Edward Hammond, and if you'd like to look, look how the soldiers, or the officer and the soldier, have arranged their arms. So they're covering the lower part of his sleeve. We believe that the picture was taken before he'd had the chance to sew on his badges. So consequently, rather than having him improperly dressed, they merely covered him up. And the gentleman covering him up is none other than Lieutenant Colonel Richards anyway. So uh, obviously he can get away with that. Uh, we've been promised an awful lot more by the family, so maybe if you've enjoyed this, and we do unearth some more stories, and Georgian people will have me back, um, perhaps we'll come back and give you some other uh, stories of the gun sites. Lastly, but by no means least, um, I'd like to well on two people um, that uh, sadly their lives were cut short in 1943. <coughs> and I'd like to set the scene first. Um, this is uh, the Togo. Uh, she, was re she was converted uh, in 1942. Um, to an armed merchant cruiser, and 1943, um, she sailed from Christiansund in occupied Norway, came south um, through the North Sea, down with the idea of breaking through the Dover Strait out into the North Atlantic to cause um, havoc amongst the convoys. The ship would have been armed with six six-inch guns. That's almost as that is as powerful as some of the bigger cruisers that we had. Uh, the Togo arrived, the Togo was under command of this gentleman here, Captain Zersay Ernst Ludwig Thieneman. Thieneman is actually a really uh, interesting officer, um, but uh, that's another, definitely another story. 
Uh, the Zogar arrived off the French coast on the night of the 8th and 9th of February, and the enemy took the decision to go through. Uh, but the moment he had made that decision, he was off Calais, he came under extremely accurate fire from Van Bay, Capel, and Coffin batteries. One of his escort ships was sunk, and uh, the enemy turned, uh, in the battle report it says that the ship turned violently to starboard and increased speed. Uh, the enemy turned tail, ran back towards Gravelins, out of the range of the guns, but unfortunately, in doing so, promptly found a big sandbank and ran aground. He then had to spend a very embarrassing and very uh, nervous uh, 12 hours in broad daylight sat on the sandbank. But strangely enough, they were, no one else had turned up. The British didn't turn up to complete the job. So um, he floated off that afternoon, went into Dunkirk, and made the run later that night. So the 9th and 10th of February now, um, he sails from Dunkirk and again comes down past Gravelines, Calais, and again comes under extremely accurate fire, this time from Wonston and from South Foreland. Wonston expend 33 shells, South Foreland expend 95. It has to be said at this point that not one of the British shells actually hit their target, although several brackets were actually recorded. Uh, the enemy came through the whole um, of the channel at maximum speed, firing his own guns to try and keep the British a bit quieter, but it didn't really work. But the coastal guns did finally silence themselves. This was to allow the Royal Air Force to come and play. And two Royal Winds from 137 Squadron, then based at Manston, came in. And one of them actually managed to come through the flak and actually managed to get a bomb onto the Togo, causing extensive damage, uh, one killed and 26 men injured. Um, to try and draw the fire away from the Togo, the coastal, German coastal batteries went into action in full counter battery mode. This is when they're firing directly at the battery rather than bigger targets. And the report, report is that the fire was very hostile and extremely accurate. Two people are killed. One is Gunnar Harold Aram, a married man from Nottingham. Um, he had a young daughter. He was aged 30, and he lies in Nottingham Cemetery with the Commonwealth War Grave headstone. And the other person that was killed is Edith <coughs> Mary Burville. Edith was a local lady. She was living on the Folkestone Road at the time. Uh, she was actually a widow uh, by 1943, as you can see her husband had died. Um, she had two sons, um, but we don't know the whereabouts of them at that, uh, during the war at all. Edith was a natty cook at Fan Bay, and we believe, given the timing of the attack, that, the, uh, that Edith was actually killed at the, at the, cookhouse, at the cookhouse itself. And, uh, very sadly, Edith actually lies in an unmarked grave next to her father. Uh, we have been trying for the past three years now to get her Commonwealth War Grave status. Uh, the Commonwealth War Graves will not give in to us. They have even denied the High Sheriff of Kent um, the uh, right he, he asked uh, on our behalf. And they said, said no, they, their point is that she was a civilian and she is commemorated in the civilian book at um, uh, Westminster Abbey. So uh, during our work week, um, in our work two weeks in December 2018, uh, we carried out an archaeological dig on the cookhouse. This is the cookhouse area here. And we decided to pay our own tributes to Edith and we buried a cross with the story of the lady that we believe was killed there. So, thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, hope you've enjoyed that, and if you've got any questions. Hi folks, I hope you enjoyed the video. Finally, I'd like to say a huge thanks to all of the History Project sponsors. Without your continued support, none of the good work we do would even be possible. So thank you.